Howdy. Well, here we are. Another week has come and gone, and we are here together again. And I just wanted to say to all my Scottish friends and those who appreciate the poetry of Robbie Burns, happy Robbie Burns Month. Um, my wife and I had a chance, and we were invited by good friends of ours to go to a Robbie uh, Burns dinner, formal dinner, and uh, it was really wonderful to go and, and, and uh, spend some time with our friends and also listen to some, some piping and some pipes and drums and some Scottish dancing, and it, it was just a really, really wonderful evening, and just wanted to sort of share that with you. Again, thank you for having me in your places, and uh, I pray that um, your week has been uh, a week of blessing in the Lord, and I pray also that uh, as you spend some time, as we spend some time together, you will be blessed by the message from God's Word today as well. So I just want to start off with asking one of those kind of uh, questions, those big kind of scale kind of questions. Uh, has anybody ever asked you to just define or explain this question? What is truth? Now, maybe it's been a while since you've even sat around with someone who asked you that and talked about it. Maybe it's been a while since you've even thought about it yourself. Or maybe this is one of those questions that you've never really put any mind to, and that's fine. So the question is, what is truth? And here's what happens when we get these kind of big life kind of questions, these bigger than me questions. And uh, we kind of have this tendency to kind of turn inward and try and dialogue with ourselves. We spend a lot of our times in our heads. Now, we do have to consider this, I believe, uh, when someone asks us a question, especially if we're in a conversation with a friend. But the, the tendency here, and the probability is... Uh, that we will miss the forest for the trees. And what's important in these kinds of questions is to maintain a healthy dose of objectivity. So let's consider, for example, the popular culture that we all live in, the culture. And keeping in mind, of course, that the culture will have impact on our thinking and our behaviors uh, in some way or form, whether we recognize it or not. And when it comes to this question about truth, the popular culture promotes plenty of its own truth claims. Well, let's look at one. For example, the truth claim, the most important thing is your health. The most important thing is your health. Now, a fellow by the name of Matt Regan, not, uh, not at all re related to the former president of the United States, um, in one of his articles, responds by saying, who says, who says the most important thing is your health? Now, of course, when I, when I'm reading this article, I responded by saying, clearly, I remember having said this before to people, yeah, it's very important to have good health. And good health is a positive and good thing to have. Yet this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about dealing with the question, what is truth? And Regan challenges culture's truth claim in regarding to the most important thing is your health, by pointing us what the James in the New Testament, uh, in his New Testament letter said in chapter 4, verse 14. James said this, For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I think we get the gist of that. So then this begs another question. What happens when you get sick, if the most important thing is your health. And we need to be reminded as, as followers of Christ, as people who read the Bible and try to understand that, and I hope we all do that, that even in our sickness, God can display his glory. Apostle Paul reminds us of this in his second letter to the Corinthian church, verse four, uh, chapter 4, pardon me, 16 to 18. Paul said this, for we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 
How about this other popular truth claim? Popular cultural truth claim. Follow your heart. Certainly very popular. Maybe we've even said that to people or someone's told us that. We certainly hear it proclaimed throughout our culture. And one of the biggest advocates of this truth claim is by far Disney. I'm just saying that that's an obvious thing. So don't make any sort of, hey, you don't like Disney thing going on here. Because Disney covertly and overtly preaches, follow your heart. Again, Regan's response to this, who says? Who says? And I want us to think objectively, and because I am a Christian, I want to think biblically. And if you carefully scrutinize the Bible, culture's truth claims to follow our hearts is not highly recommended. We see this when Paul examined his own heart and tells us in his own words what he found uh, on the impact of sin in his own life. And he describes it like a war that's raging inside of himself. He said in his Romans letter, Romans letters, chapter 7, verse 18, he said this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Then he says this, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 24 Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to stop it there because he gives us the answer after that. Because the, the point here is we're talking about the truth claim that, that the culture proclaims to follow your heart. We see that that's not really a great recommendation to follow our hearts from Paul himself. And I suppose if we're ever tempted or we, are, or we decide to go down that road to follow our hearts, we should remember what Jesus said about our hearts. We know here in the Galatians letter, chapter 5, we see the fruit of the Spirit for a person who is uh, uh, following Christ and who is wanting to be more and more like his Savior, his or her Savior. You know, we have the fruit of the Spirit, you know, kindness and gentleness and self-control and love and those fruit. But Jesus said this. Of course, the backdrop there is he, his disciples are accused of not washing their hands before eating. That was a required ceremonial law of, the, of Judaism in the day. He said this, What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Where, where does this coming from? It comes from the heart. So we're back to our question, what is truth? And, and my recommendation is that you hear what Jesus said the truth is. He said this in uh, John 14, 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Now I say all these things because I want us to end what, what Jesus said. Because we're going to be talking about, in the Galatian letter here today, about Jesus. And I wanted us to focus on Jesus and what he says about our lives and our salvation and all those things. So please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. We continue where we left off yesterday, uh, last week I mean, and uh, we left off in verse 14, now we pick it up in verse 15 to the end of the chapter, verse 21. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. Please join me in reading. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I die to the law, so that I might live to God. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose, for no purpose, Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you now for the time that we will be here in it together. I pray for the hearer of this word, and and myself included, Lord, that we would not only hear the word, that we would do the word as well in our lives. And thank you, Lord, that you lead us by your spirit. Your Holy Spirit is abiding in us and teaching us and molding us and shaping us to be like your son, Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So last week, we left off with Paul publicly opposing Peter in Antioch. Peter had gone up to Antioch to be with the Christian Christians there, the Jews and Gentiles there. Yet Paul got right up into his mug in front of others and called Peter a hypocrite. And this is why we find this in verse 14. If, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? While Peter was visiting the Christians in Antioch, he would um, have meals with Jew and Gentile believer alike. That is until some from what Paul called the circumcision party, verse 12, showed up. And Peter, fearing these people, drew back and separated himself. Again, verse 12, chapter 2. Who did he draw back from? He drew back from the Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, we might say how ridiculous that is, even how wrong that is. And I hope that today that Christians understand that societal divisions do not warrant exclusion from the church. However, we were reminded over the past few weeks as we looked at this letter that the church began as God had promised through the prophets with Israel and specifically in Jerusalem. It was on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached his first sermon that 3,000 came into faith in Christ and became the first part of the church and it grew. So the church was in the beginning typically Jewish. But we were also reminded over these past few weeks that God's redemptive purpose in history was intended to bless all the nations. And it was not long after the church had been established in Jerusalem that the message of the gospel went beyond the walls of the city. And this letter to the Galatians was Paul's response to the concerns, to, what, to his concerns, what was happening in the churches that he had planted in amongst the Gentiles in Galatia, that is modern-day Turkey. So by the time Paul got into Peter's mug after his actions there by drawing back from eating with the Gentiles, it had already been decided that Paul's gospel was a true gospel. Remember, he had gone there to Jerusalem Uh, not to have cappuccino and toast or crumpets or whatever you want to call it. Paul was not doubting his gospel when he went to Jerusalem to speak to the apostles there and the church there. He was responding in obedience to a revelation from God to go. Friends, this was a divine appointment because here was a historic hinge point, a historic juncture in redemptive history. It was moving into wider and wider circles beyond Jerusalem. And Paul had realized that that was at stake, what was at stake when Peter drew back from the Gentile Christians. Keeping in mind, this is what was so important to Paul, was not only his true gospel, but that the unity and equality of the gospel was there too. Unity of the church and its mission to spread the good news of Jesus Christ was at stake. For the availability of the gospel was to be for every race, creed, and color. So Paul, beginning here at verse 15, continues to defend his gospel in response to the Judaizers in Galatia who were presenting another gospel. We read about that in chapter 1. And denying that Paul's gospel was sufficient for salvation. The Judaizers would argue that along with Christ. Gentile Christians needed to include circumcision 
and the law as well. And if you think about it, the Judaizers had plenty of biblical precedent to say these things. They would have appealed to the Bible. They would appeal to God's covenant with Israel. Their arguments would have seemed to be grounded in biblical precedent and truth. Yet here in verse 15, Paul presents, when we look at the initial verse there, how, just the beginning of the sentence, which continues to run on into 16, it looks like Paul agrees with the Judaizers, for he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile Christians, uh, Gentile sinners. Verse 15, 15. Yet when we look into the next verse, 16, we see the verb no. The question is, what is the subject of that verb? It is we who are Jews by birth. And my friends, this is the same argument that Paul used against Peter in verse 14. The same argument they used there, he uses here to the Galatian churches and to the believers there. For you see, the question facing the Galatian, facing the Galatian churches was this. As one commentator put it so well, quote, is the truth of the gospel or is the law the basis for deciding fellowship between Jewish and Gentile Christians? What is it? The truth of the gospel or the law that decides how the Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians should fellowship together, unite together? And we should put this in our own words and context. Think it in this way, if you will. Is the truth of the gospel or is wealth, position, education, competencies, social position, political biases the basis for deciding who gets to fellowship together? Is it the truth of the gospel or is it your political party? Is it the truth of the gospel or your wealth? Is it your position or the truth of the gospel that decides who gets to fellowship together? So I want to point you to verse 16. And Paul's statement there, let's read it together. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. The we is the Jewish Christians. Just keep that in mind. Verse 16 then here, 16, is as one commentator put it, one of the most important verses in Galatians. Now why is that? Why would he say that? Well, this verse contains what who has often been called throughout the, the centuries, and certainly in my experience as a Christian, the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace. And this, my friends, was Paul's point all along. The Judaizers were attempting to add law to the gospel. Paul was preaching that the work of Christ on the cross was not only sufficient, but more to the point, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians are not united or divided because of the law, but are united because of God's unmerited grace and mercy in and through his son, Jesus Christ. For Christians are in union with Christ. Please notice with me the word justified in our text. It's used four times in verse 16 to 17. And this word justified in the original means illegal term. This word justified means a legal term also in the English. Another word we need to define is the word law. And we can't be comprehensive here, obviously, but generally we're looking here at the Mosaic law. And because of the situation in Galatia and some of the other churches that would happen is the um, is circumcision. Where circumcision was a sign and seal of the covenant of God with Israel. But I don't want to get bogged down in these terms. We're not, we're not researching or writing a commentary. And let's keep it simple. Let's, let's get back to the basics. The basics of when we study the Bible. Now, we need to understand grammar. Grammar is the key. Uh, it's natural with us. Uh, those of us are, that are, you know, speak the English language or other languages, we know where to put all the verbs and the adjectives when we're speaking. And yeah, we kind of mess it up a little bit sometimes, but it, it, we just, we don't even think about it. We just know it. But when you're reading a set of verses or a verse or whatever in the Bible, we need to bring it down to the basics. We need to understand the grammar and how it works. So in this text before us, the Paul uses the verb 
justified four times, and then he uses the noun law, and I'm using the word law with a capital L, six times. So it is reasonable to see or understand this, that Paul is doing something here with this grammar, that he's contrasting these two. He's contrasting the verb justified with the noun law. And he's pointing out that something very important is happening here in the relationship between these verbs, this verb justified, and the noun law. So the question is, what happened? Well, it's two-word answer. Jesus happened. We can go to Paul's comments in his letter to Philippi, the Philippian letter, which will help us. We can go to chapter 3. You can turn there if you want. We'll be here for a few, a few minutes. Chapter 3 of Philippians. And Paul has some very strong words in there for these Judaizers that he's even dealing with here in Galatia. He said this about them. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now he's talking about circumcision. Because in the very next verse he says, then he said this. For we are the circumcision. Now the question is, who are the we? Well, in Paul's context... It was the Jewish and Gentile believers. These he calls the circumcised. The question is, how then are they circumcised? Because he's obviously going away from the physical aspect of it. He says in Philippians 3.3, believers are circumcised because they worship by the Spirit of God. The sign and seal of the covenant with God through Christ is the Holy Spirit. That's what he's referring to in this sentence, for we are the circumcision. And he goes on to say that believers glory in Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. And in that very same uh, tone, he gives himself as an example of one who at one time was zealous and very confident in the flesh. He was zealous for the law and, and he said he was so zealous that he, he was even a persecutor of the church. So zealous that he believed that he was righteous under the law. Then something happened. Jesus happened. And then he said this in Philippians 3.8 I count everything a loss. I count everything a loss. Think about this. Paul is discounting his credentials. He has a Ph.D. in the law. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's discounting and not counting anything, uh, any confidence in the law. He's even discounting his birthright. For he says in the text, you know, he was the, from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. That doesn't matter to him. All of it, he says here in Philippians 3.8, is rubbish to him. This word rubbish is a nice way of saying dung. Everything is done. Paul has no confidence any longer in the law. And this was the argument that the Judaizers were trying to sell to the Galatian believers. To be right before God, to be in covenant with God, to live for God, to be justified in God's side required observance of the law. And Paul says, no, no, that's rubbish, absolute rubbish. We see here in verse 16 that we know, he said this, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. So then that begs the question, how is one justified? How is one made right before a holy and just God? How can one live for God? He tells us in verse 16, through faith in Jesus Christ. We see in Paul's letter to the Romans, he said that Jesus was put to death for our, what? Trespasses and raised for our justification. Romans 4.25. He was put to death for our sins. And then he was raised for our justification. Remember what I said, what this word justified means, a legal term. So to be justified before God is to be legally and formally acquitted from the guilt of our sin. So the punishment of our sin is not applied by God himself who is our judge. 
Christ bore all our sin on his body and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And when he was raised from the dead, we therefore now can have justification in our faith with God. But the question is, where does this put the law? How are we to understand the law as those who are justified through faith alone in Christ alone? And this is important. This is very important in many different reasons. And, you know, especially when we evangelize. Because the tendency, and I've, I've seen this from some pulpits. I've seen this from people talking about their, the way they evangelize, the way they share the gospel. Is they completely do not mention the law at all. We do not mention it at all. But it's important. The law and the gospel go together. We have the good news of the gospel, but the reason we have the good news is there's some bad news. And that's where the law comes in. Again, we go to Paul's commentary in Romans, Romans chapter 7. Of course, Paul would say there that Christians have been, let's, let's read uh, verse 6 together, released from the law, having died to what which held us captive, to that we, to that we serve, so that we serve in the new way of the Holy Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code, Romans 7, 6. And the key phrase here in relation to the law is, held us captive. This is, my friends, the purpose of the law, as Paul would say in Romans 7, 7. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. See, the law is not sin. But it points to the sin in you and me. Matter of fact, the law is not sin because Paul even says in Romans 7, 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And it is because it was given by God who is righteous and good. But it points to the sin in you and me. Now, I, I'm just going to stop there because we can go on and on and on. But my hope that is that we understand that we all have started with the law. We all have started with the law. For the law reveals that we all have, want, have all sinned. And for those who don't believe that or try to say, look, I'm really, really good, I have some questions for you. Have you ever lied just once? Have you ever taken something that did not belong to you just once? Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain just once? Just once. Well, the law would point out that the one who has done these things just once is a liar, a blasphemer, and a thief, and comes under the condemnation of a just and holy law, for they are lawbreakers. Now, we keep this in mind. We look at verse 17 that's right there before you. It's very interesting. For the accusation was that Paul's gospel was not only incomplete, but would give people the license to sin. The thinking goes something like this. Follow me if you can. Okay, Paul. So you say you are justified only in Christ alone? We'll give you that much. Yet you say you are a sinner. Does this not make Jesus a servant of sin? Verse 17. You see how that argument would be there. And Paul responds to that argument by saying, God forbid, God forbid, certainly not, God forbid, however you want to put it. If I build again the things I destroyed, I make myself a lawbreaker. Your Bible might say transgressor. I'm using the word lawbreaker. Verse 18. And two things stand out here. One, if we return to the law after we believe in Jesus, we then break the law. We, it's like going back to the graveyard. Two, the gospel of grace, my friends, the gospel of grace frees you and me from the slavery of sin. Yes, of course we sin. And prayfully and hopefully less and less and less as we are continually being transformed by the Spirit of God. But the gospel of grace frees you from the slavery of sin. So I have some questions for you. When we think about the gospel of grace, have you ever taken God for granted? 
Let me be a little more specific. Have you ever abused God's grace? Can I just turn even up the heat a bit more? Have you ever used God's grace as a license to sin? I think all of us would understand uh, how God takes sin so seriously. After all, he did say that sin leads only to one destination. That's death, eternal separation, and eternal damnation. So let me ask you again. Have you ever abused God's grace? That's one side of the same coin. We can call that hyper-grace. Some people use that term for other reasons. I'm going to call it for this. That we use, it as a, we use God's grace as a license to sin. Same coin, other side. How about this question? Is your relationship with God built on a foundation of how good you are? You know, uh, you read your Bible, I'm glad you do. You give, I'm glad you do. You go to church every Sunday, I'm glad you do. You pray, I'm glad you do. You serve, I'm glad you do. You serve your community, you serve the poor, I'm glad you do. But yet, think about this. Is your relationship with God all about you and your works? Then you have built your relationship on the legalistic foundation, and thereby you have broken the law. Now we move into verses 19 to 20. Uh, I want to spend the rest of our time there. And I just want to say that this is a wonderful picture of a transformation that has taken place in a believer. Matter of fact, I, I, I would say that this is what happens when you become a believer. You, become, you have a brand new life. Brand spanking new. A brand new life takes place. And in these verses here, 19 and 20, we see the contrast is life and death. And verse 19 tells us, for through the law I died to the law. This is what Paul said. That's the death part. Simply put, the penalty of one who has not kept the law perfectly is death. For my friends, none are able to keep the law perfectly. Only Jesus ever did that. We have all broken it at some point, at least once. And that's all it takes. And like Paul, all of us have died to the law. Then something amazing happened. Jesus happened. A brand new life happened. And Jesus does bring life. Life today and life eternal. He brings the living dead, the walking dead, to life. Every believer, according to Paul, has been crucified with Christ. All our sin, all sin, Yesterday's sin, today's sin, and tomorrow's sin has been crucified with Christ. And a believer no longer lives for himself, but lives for God. Verse 19. And the life we now live in the body, in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. And here's the really amazing bit. And because the believer is dead to themselves, it is Christ who lives in and through us, verse 20. And all this, verse 20 reminds us that Jesus loved us, loved you and me, and he gave himself for you and me. Here's the great exchange, the great exchange. Christ says, you give me your sin, all of it, and it's all paid for, once for all, and I'll give you my righteousness, my justification. And all the work of God, for God is the one, the Bible teaches us, that is the just and the justifier. We don't do nothing. We're the recipients of God's grace and mercy. It's such an amazing grace, this brand new life that we have in Christ. That we are free indeed to live a life of faith in Christ. And that's the key. That's what unlocks all the blessings of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, is our faith in Christ. The Bible tells us that Abraham, he was still Abram, when he accepted and obeyed God, his faith in God was counted to him as righteousness. Faith is what unlocks all the blessings of God through his son, Jesus Christ. We have a brand new life in Christ. Well, as I bring this to a close, I'm going to share a quote from Charles Spurgeon. If you don't know who Charles Spurgeon was, uh, you can always Google him. Charles Spurgeon said this, 
It is not the strength of your faith that saves you, but the strength of him upon who you rely. Christ is able to save you if you come to him. Be your faith weak or be it strong. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this uh, word from your word, from the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy that we find in your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I just wanted to say a few things here. Um, if you've heard this and you're not a child of God in the sense that you're not a follower of Christ, you haven't committed, you haven't repented, turned to God and received Christ as your Savior, I would appeal to you, do that. that. Do it now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Our tomorrows are not guaranteed. Remember what James said about our lives. It's but a brief mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. So I would encourage you to, to come to Christ. And um, you know, if you're watching this video or hearing this video, just uh, leave me a comment. And I'll connect with you. And I'll help you as best I can. So thank you very much for being uh, with me. And thank you for inviting me into your places. Have a fantastic week. God bless. Shalom.